Hello, and welcome to another exciting episode of Have Game Will Travel. I'm your host, Bennett Newsom, also known as Damn It Bennett, out there in the internet. Uh, as the director of esports growth and development here at Full Sail University, I'm passionate about exploring the diverse world of esports and gaming beyond just skill level. Uh, so whether it's your first time watching or you're a returning fan, we're thrilled to have you joining us for this virtual journey through the experiences of industry professionals. Uh, so get ready to engage with our guests and learn from their perspectives. Uh, but remember to submit your questions in the chat. We'll feature them here and get you the answers that you're looking for. Uh, but sit back and enjoy the ride as we kick off another episode of Have Game Will Travel. Our guest is joining us here. Steffi, uh, why don't you go ahead and uh, introduce yourself? Yes. Hi, everyone. My name is Steffi Bao, and um, I come from Italy. Awesome. Well, welcome. We're so excited to have you on the show and uh, uh, tell us a little bit about your background and, and kind of what led you to your current pursuits. Yeah, how much time do you have? <laughs> yeah. We've got about an hour, so. <laughs> all right, all right. So, um, yeah, so let's try to, to sum it up. Well, I was born in Italy, like I said, and uh, um, I was a little girl with a, a very big passion for motorcycling. My mom and dad they were fans of the sport, so they used to go to watch the World Championship round when it was coming to Italy. They brought me there since I was like a little baby. And then one day when I was about six years old, I looked at my mom and dad in the eyes and I said, I wanted to become a professional motor motocross racer and I will move to the United States of America for it. So at six, six years old, you can understand it. And my dad and my mom were like, yes, kiddo, go, go play. Right. <laughs> you know? But, you know, I ended up winning three world titles, uh, moving to the United States and uh, also becoming the first woman ever to compete at the top of the sport um, for, for motocross. That's incredible. How did you, how did you kind of, uh, did you, I guess the better question is, has gaming always been something that you've been passionate about or did that come later in life? Gaming came later, and uh, I have a funny story to, to share, meaning that when I was a professional uh, athlete, I was lucky enough to be featured as a character in two video games. That's awesome. All right, so when you are, uh, you know, like an athlete at that level, you are a one-track mind, so you really don't have <laughs> time to do anything else but yeah. train and perform and eat well and all of that. So I was super stoked that I was in games, you know, like, but I didn't really, you know, spend much time playing video games. And then what happened in my life is that about three years ago, so beginning of the pandemic, I was in Italy and I saw my little niece that she was spending three to four hours a day watching people play games, video games. So because I'm a person and you will know more about me as we go along, they really, really like to try to break that glass ceiling, you know, and open yeah. opportunity for women in and minorities in male dominated industry. I'm like, hmm, maybe there is an opportunity here, you know, to use uh, e-sport and specifically sim racing because it's where mm -hmm. I have the passion and come back around for silk or, you know, and try to do something like that. So that's kind of like my intro to the gaming world was because i was lucky enough to be on uh, on two games yeah. uh, that was back in in 2000 so <laughs> a long time ago and now you know i have init esport today it's my company where we focus on uh, creating super fun events to bring more women and minorities into the space that's incredible it's got to be probably pretty cool to like play yourself in the game <laughs> right like <laughs> i mean it, it's a pretty cool thing you know like uh, I, I wish you have, you know, some take on that because uh, it's it's fun. Like if you see it, you can still hear my accent you know, <laughs> in the game. So everybody say, "Yep, that is Steffi." <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, if we go if we go backwards, obviously six years yes. old, you wanted to be a uh, professional uh, motocross, uh, you know, rider. Um, yeah. Obviously, the traditional school route uh, was was important too, right? You did mm -hmm. uh, get a degree, and, and that was in accounting. Is that correct? That is correct. It yes. seems like the so, opposite side of the spectrum. Well, accounting, motocross, like <laughs> yes. <laughs> so that again, you know, like uh, since uh, I was uh, incredibly focused on wanting to to become a champion in Italy, there is no such a thing that is homeschooling. Mm -hmm. So you have to go to school, and my parents always made that a priority. So they said, if you don't perform at school, guess what? The motorcycle stays in the garage, and we're not <laughs> going racing. So for me, I always try. Okay, I need to 
to do the best I can, you know, like so I can have as much as I can to do the sport that I want. So in reality, accounting was the fastest route <laughs> to have a degree, you know, so I could go and continue to do to do my sport. But um, yeah, so I do have a degree and I think that education is incredibly important. And I feel lucky that I was able to do it in that way, because sometimes you can see in the sports that people that get on school, they really having a little bit more hard time, you mm -hmm. know, and then when you're done with your career, then what, yeah. right? So education is so important. And I always say, everybody, don't discount it. You yeah. need to get your studies in. Absolutely. And so while you were studying, uh, how did you balance your, I, I think this is a, a, a really <laughs> important topic because we have a lot of students that obviously are playing esports and going to school at the same time. Uh, how did you balance your academic pursuits with your love for motocross? And, and did you find that, uh, racing kind of help maybe serve as like a form of stress relief or, or kind of take you away from the, uh, you know, mental break from, from studying. Right. Um, no, I don't think it was more like that. It was more like that, uh, uh for me, it was about scheduling. Right. Okay. So, you know, like uh, to me it was like uh, the school is something that I needed to do to do then what I really wanted to do. So, you know, like by doing scheduling, you know, and make sure that I hit my marks on what I need to do for the school, then, you know, I was having more time to go and do and do my sport. It was not really a stress reliever. That's kind of like what I really wanted to do. So as you know, you know, in life, if you have a passion, it doesn't become heavy, you know, like because it's something that, you know, you want to do. So that kind of like for me was more in that way. You know, like it was more like uh, make sure that everything was scheduled and 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 then I could do the and the thing that I needed to do. However, I wanted to touch on a, on a, on on an experience because being a professional athlete, it can get all lonely at some point because of also this opportunity about being in school, meaning that everybody you know they were school friends and I was study with and I'm going to the school with. In the weekend, guess what they were doing? Getting together and having yeah. fun. <laughs> For me, I was going racing. So, you know, I always been sort of like an outsider, but instead of taking it as a downer, you know, I was just like, well, you know, it is what it is. I need to have an education because one day I will stop racing. So I, I need to do my own business. Yeah. So, you know, I was continuing to that focus and then you know, like going racing in the weekend, but it was difficult. So definitely it wasn't a stress release if you <laughs> compare it to the fact of uh, having an environment at school, Yeah. you know, but nevertheless, you know, I, I did it like that because I loved it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, motocross seems like a, a highly competitive and obviously like a physically demanding sport. Um, yes. <laughs> as a kid, you, six years old, what, what was the motivation really just from seeing it or I, I think it was seeing it. And also at, at, right around that time, my dad bought a motorcycle for himself and there was a motorcycle to go like a trail riding. So just in the dirt, you know, like yeah. enduro style. So my mom and dad own a butcher shop. So the only time that my dad had the opportunity, you know, to do something was just on Sunday where the shop was closed. Yeah. But every time he was going out, you know, like uh, with my uncle and a couple of friends, really from the, the house, when he was coming back, he had the biggest smile on his face, all dirty, full of mud. <laughs> and me seeing that, I'm like, I want to do that too. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like. So that's kind of like uh, how it, it all started and how I felt in love with, with that. I guess it was fell in love with the happiness that mm -hmm. my dad had, you know, and then I wanted to experience the same thing. And then I was lucky enough that my parents were crazy and said, yeah, let's put the little girl on the motorcycle. Why not? <laughs> I love that. And, and I, I assume there was a lot of barriers to overcome, uh, you know, being a woman in this space. Uh, talk to us a little bit about kind of that journey. Yes. Yeah, so, so uh, of course, like when you are at a, a young age, there's not really that many dif differences between um, girls and boys. You know, it's almost when you start to hit the puberty level, you know, the teenager level that uh, things change. But again, you know, like at, at the beginning, you know, on my on my life, it was a, a lot about being focused, you know, and I when I hit those uh, years in my life, I was very, very good at what I was doing in, in the sport. So I won a, a male Italian championship at 17 years old. So, you know, like that also came with a different type of set of, uh, 
I don't know if I should call it issue, but like a, a different experiences in life, mm -hmm. let's call it like that, which is like, uh, yeah, now all of a sudden you're getting this fame, you're getting this no notability, I think that's the word, you know, uh, and then, and then, you know, you feel like you are the best they can walk, you know, on this <laughs> earth, right? Which it does come with the territory, you know, I think every professional athlete has that, which it is cockiness, so <laughs> it comes with the territory, but you cannot have to be like that if you need to perform. You need to believe yeah. that you're the best in the world, you know, and this comes not only for my sport, the monocross, but I think in anything everybody mm -hmm. does in life, you know, especially in early stages, you know, when you're trying to establish who you are as an individual, you got to believe that, yeah. you know, because otherwise it's going to be much harder to convince others, you know, that you have the skill to do what you say that you want to do. Absolutely. And so, I'm, sh I'm sure the adversity was there and people saying, Hey, you, you can't do this, you know, type of, of yeah, thing. For sure. And I'm not a person that take no for an answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it, it seems that way. I mean, like throughout your motocross career, you accomplished uh, an impressive, what, 14 titles became the first yes. woman to compete in the male motocross yeah. championship in 2005. Uh, t talk to us a little bit about maybe like your proudest moment uh, of your professional racing career. Yes. So there are a few, of course, you know, like uh, winning the first world title was like, uh, check. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. Like uh, that you want to have it on, on your, on your uh, resume, but also, you know, like uh, going back on what we were just talking about uh, being difficult for a woman to do something like this also by doing it as a first time. A lot of time I was having people say, oh, but it's just Steffi. So it's just her doing that, you know, and mm -hmm. sometimes in the sport, that's why they were not going to pay me as much as the guys because, oh, that is just Steffi is just one of a kind, right? Yep. So that was a hard pill to swallow. And that's also why I'm doing what I'm doing right now. Right. But what I was going with this is that I did, I want to share this story because it, it was a very good uh, I would say full circle story at the end. So what that happened was that uh, when I was uh, uh, young, like younger, when I was uh, uh, 20 years old, I was going to become the, uh, I, I did a trial to be able to go and represent Italy in the world championship okay. because back in the days with the men. So back in the days, only a select number of people like the top five per country, you know, were then given the license to go and, and represent their own country wow. in the world championship. So you do a trial that is based on lap times, right? So I did that and I got third fastest time, right? So I was on, like on top of the world, <laughs> you know, like I, I, I made history at 20 years old, yeah. you can imagine, right? Then a few days later, I received a letter from the um, Italian Federation that says, we have decided not to send you because you are a woman. So, <laughs> of course, I politely, you know, um, say words to them. <laughs> sort of like that. And then I say, you know what, I'm going to go to America and I'm going to do it there, yeah. you know, and that's that's kind of like the, the very jumping to come to the United States was because of that and came here and I became the first woman to race in Supercross, which is the biggest sport here in the U.S. So with that opportunity, I, there was no discrimination because yeah. here, you know, with the points, you know, a man or a woman, if you have the skill, you have the points, you're in. Right. So I was able to do it. And then five years later, it came full circle back because I did get the uh, World Federation saying, hey, you know, we know what you're doing in the United States and now we would like for you yeah. to race in the World Championship and we'll make it a special, you know, thing and whatnot. And I said, perfect. This is how much it's going to cost you. And they paid. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> That's so maybe a, a lesson on that is like never give up. Yeah. Never ever give up. And if somebody tells you, "Oh, you cannot do that," I think the answer should be, "Watch me." Yeah, a hundred percent. I, I, you know, I think that's a, a motivation for a lot of people is that, um, you know, when you're passionate about something and you want to do it, you you go out there and do it, no matter mm -hmm. what's in front of you. And it seems like that you've you've been that way your whole career. Um, obviously you had an injury that kind of changed yes. things up for you. Uh, tell us a little bit about that experience. 
Yes, so, you know, motocross is a hard sport on the body. Yes. So I did break a lot of bones throughout my career, but unfortunately I had one accident that was the one that kind of like stopped my racing. I ended up uh, a case in a jump. So what that means is like if you have two jumps, like one here and one here, and you'll do it with only one um, transition, you know, I landed on this you know like so in the second okay. one so it's kind of like comparing to jump off of a four-story building yes. <laughs> you know? so both of my ankle exploded and uh yes and uh going to the emergency room right away you know to try to figure it out and i still remember that i was on on the bed be rolled in and the surgeon said one percent chance that we can save your legs. We might have to do an amputation, wow. but my my answer were like, okay, but when can I go back racing? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, you know, like um, going back racing did not happen. You know, it yeah. took a long time to to fix my problem. I did have a bad times, yeah. so you know, like uh, it, it did happen, and I'm not ashamed of it. You know, yeah. people go through this thing. So, I was in a dark spot because all of a sudden the life they knew stopped, in like this. Yeah. And uh, a lot of time you don't think about the future, especially when you're younger. You know, so I was like, and now what? What I'm gonna do? Yeah. You know, so I did have my bad time. But luckily, you know, having friends and family around, you know, I was able to say to really turn negative to positive. And I say, hey, maybe this is an opportunity. I was 28 when I got hurt, saying that, uh, I, you know, I had a very good career in racing. Maybe now I can start another one that is as successful. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So by grabbing the positivity out of it, you know, I was able to come out of that hole. <laughs> yeah. Know? And then do what I do now. <laughs> yeah, and that and that you kind of pivoted to coaching and yes. and mentoring like new champions, right? Um, Correct. Obviously, that's it's got to be another rewarding aspect of this, you know, being able to not only experience that for yourself, but then pass that on, share that with others. Talk talk to uh, us a little bit about kind of um, that pivot and and how that all started for you. Yeah, for sure. So you know, like uh, by having this big transition transition and big change in my life i decided to go from one side of the fence to the other side of the fence so they think of course they knew what to do was racing yeah. so like be able to coach other women you know and be able to and, and guys too to share with them my experience it was incredibly rewarding because at the very beginning, I was not able to demonstrate what I was what I was trying to say to people because I was on a wheelchair. Right. So that experience actually was amazing because I ended up using what I learned in school, which is math and physics, to be able to explain to everybody how a motorcycle uh, and leverages, you know, and position uh, applies by using everyday example. And all of a sudden, they're like, oh, this makes sense yeah. <laughs> but for me it was like a way because i'm like how i'm gonna tell these people what they can do to get better if i cannot show it right because i'm on a wheelchair so i even take that as a lesson you know like that from my disability that i had then to be able to change people's life you know and become better riders so it was super cool people loved it some of the teaching they did back then became you know something that now every coach uses it yeah. you know because uh it to me is always important to create um a way to relate with others you know so i always work with that wavelength i like that and it sounds like you kind of almost revolutionized maybe that coaching side of things uh with with what you had brought to the table um and your perspective which mm -hmm. is really cool uh we have a question here from our chat which is um, did you have full uh, support from your family and friends when you uh, you made your career move? And, and how did that help shape your journey? Yes. So I did have, as I mentioned, you know, full support from uh, my friends and my family from getting out of that bad situation. I was there mentally, <laughs> you know, yeah. and... Uh, and one thing I can say to everybody, if they ever, you know, get into that position, ask for help. Don't keep it in, ask for help because there are people out there, they are there to want to help you. Yeah. So, you know, and, and you need that help. So that's an important part. Um, 
and then I guess, you know, like I moved, you know, from the other side, from one side of the fence to the other side of the fence. But I don't think that was kind of like a, a pushing factor, like the people and family needed to push me You're to right. do that. I, I always came from me, you know, yeah. like, so I'm that kind of person that uh, if I have something in my head, I'll figure it out a way yeah. to make it happen. <laughs> Uh, I hope I answered my question. The question. Yeah, definitely. And uh, you also, you know, kind of took this a step further um, from your co coaching and mentoring, and you founded the the twelve eleven MX school, um, mm -hmm. which gained a, a ton of mainstream recognition. It was featured on CNN, uh, which yes. is awesome. Um, mm -hmm. What were some of your biggest challenges that you faced uh, in building and promoting this, you know, this new company, and how do you overcome them? Yes. So for me, again, I really like to go for the underdogs <laughs> and, and then helping people that have no opportunities otherwise. Yeah. So, you know, like for the school, I, I was a very much, you know, there for people that needed the help the most. So a lot of the time, those people had good stories. And that's why the media ended up saying, hmm, this is interesting. I want to touch briefly on two of them. One is uh, this friend of mine, we became very good friends since, that she um, connected with me from Iran. Okay. So by connecting from Iran, she tells me, I would like if you can come here to teach a motocross school to women in Iran. And I'm like, what about you come here yeah. and then I'll teach you how to teach other women in Iran. And she said, perfect, I'll do that. So she worked very hard to get a visa and whatever, you know, yeah. to come here in the US United States. And she came. This were, uh, woman, is, her name is Nura Naragi. She is so good and she has the same kind of desire to want to make a difference for women. Yeah. That when she was here, of course, you know, started to create a general little bit of an attention, especially back into her country, because unfortunately, in our country still, women cannot even drive, yeah. you know, let alone learn how to do motocross. So when she was here and, and did all of this, we got, uh, um, and she got a letter from her country saying that if she was going to continue to do this with her idea to come in Iran and teach other women, she was going to get stoned. You people don't understand. Yeah. Stone. We are in the 21st century. And that was she was told. She was going to get stoned. <laughs> you know. That's insane. It is insane. You know. So I'm like, oh, I just only needed to know that. <laughs> So because of that, I connected with CNN and then CNN came over and we told the story and the story went on CNN and uh, and then the government backed up you know, so said, no, we are OK if you can come back, you know, like we're going to give you a dedicated area where you can do this. So I feel like it was a win for her, but for human rights in general, you know, to be able to do something like this and all thanks to the attention of telling the story to the world yeah. so that's one the other one that is super cool too it's a woman in uh, a young girl in uh, zimbabwe so <laughs> the story with tanya tanya muzin is her name was very cool because i received an email from uh, her father by saying we have a little girl here in Zimbabwe and we would like for you to come over here and teach her and uh, become our mentor and our coach and uh, we can pay all the expenses for you to go there. I'm like, delete. I thought it was one of these, you know. Yeah, spam, right? African spam, you know, princess, <laughs> there, right? I'm like, delete. It came again, you know, like, so with a second thing, I'm like, nah, this is a scam, you know, like right. it's never been heard of somebody <laughs> from, you know, Africa, especially, you know, like uh, backcountry Africa, right? right? You know, like to, to have the passion for motocross and whatnot, right? So yeah. they lead. Well, they, and the third time, I guess third time was the charm because <laughs> I answered that and it was one of the best things I ever done in my life because going to Africa, and living the rural African experience and helping a girl that has the same passion that I have, it was just magic in the happening. And uh, yeah, we was able to help her in so many ways. The first one, it goes back to the education. She was not going to school when I went there because they couldn't afford tuition. And I'm like, that's the first thing we're going to 
fix. Yeah. So by generating attention for me as a world champion going to Zimbabwe, you know, like uh, we got the government involved and excited and say, first thing, Tanya needs to start going to school. And the beauty of all of that is like this little kid at nine years old, you know, went to school. Three years later, she calls me and she said, I want to do a, a, a not foundation, but like put the funds, you know, toward other girls to be able to go to school. Yeah. Can you help me on that? And now she has been sending since then 200 girls from rural Africa to school. Wow. That's incredible. <laughs> yes. Yeah, those are fun stories. For yeah, sure. <laughs> I mean, that's that's life changing stuff, not only for the individuals that you worked with, but then it, you know, it keeps going down to, yeah. to others. And, and that's that's really huge. Uh, your career. I mean, it's it's really impressive because it spans in so many different directions. I feel like we're probably not going to be able to cover it all today. But, you, you know, we, we we're going to fast forward a little bit because I think yes. you, it's important to at least get a, a key of where we where we are. You've worked yeah. in a lot of different roles. Um, you know, you yes. worked for YouthStream uh, for mm -hmm. a while uh, as a general manager of the FIM Women's World Championship. Uh, mm -hmm. what, were, what were kind of some of your responsibilities as the, as the general yes. manager of that? So that was like when I started kind of walking again after my injury, um, the championship I was racing in asked me, hey, would you like to be the general manager so you can kind of coach all of these girls right. that they're, they used to compete against you. And now, you know, like you can be the mama. Yeah. And I'm like, <laughs> yes, yes. Because I remember early when I said um, for a lot of time during my career, oh, that's just Steffi. Now for me, it was like, ah, oh, I'm going to make everybody just like Steffi, yeah. <laughs> you know, but because we were not, we were not any more a uh, competitor, the recipe was perfect at that point. So I could, uh, you know, coach them and help them and, 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 and get them their attention so much so that at one point we got the female championship to start to have much more mainstream attention than the yeah. guys. And then at that point they said, ah, we're going to have to declass the, the women championship. And I'm like, okay, well, I'm not going to be involved in this then. So that's when I change. Yeah. And that led to kind of the next area, which was the, um, your involvement in the women's commission, uh, which mm -hmm. kind of aimed to empower men, women across the motorsports uh, industry. Correct. Uh, mm -hmm. Talk to us about, about the commission a little bit. Yes, so the FIM and now also the FIA, which is the car um, uh, federation, global federation, um, the FIM made a commission for women. So all women were part of the commission to really try to help and understand what it can be done to bring uh, in the sports in front of more eyes. Um, it was a great opportunity. I learned a ton and I learned how politics works. Yep. <laughs> Let's put it like that. Yep. <laughs> 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 so yes it was a good experience and um but i'm let's put it like this okay i'm more like a, a person of action yes so talking is good mm -hmm. but action to me is more important so it's the execution right uh-huh absolutely so, yes well i I, okay. I definitely believe that that is how you you are because what you've done in your career just continues to build it shows the action it shows you going out and and doing which is which is huge you and uh your partner founded the elite top 10 wmx uh mm -hmm. and you served as the project director uh, that started what back in 2019 um yes. looking back at that experience uh, do you have any like valuable lessons that you learned that uh kind of help uh continue to shape what you're doing today yes i would say that anything that i have put my mind to it and created it it has the same common bottom line. Mm -hmm. It is to inspire people, open up opportunity, and always uh, execute what you're trying to do. So anything, if you see, uh, even though some, some things are maybe a little bit off, you know, like from my uh, uh, path on the racing thing, but that's the common denominator, you know, right. like always to try to push and help. So it's not easy, 
you know, <laughs> no. it's not easy, but uh, resilience. And uh, I have to say what I've learned as a athlete, a professional athlete, it helped me a ton in the business world because um, monocross uh, for me, like anything that you, uh, you do in regards to uh, racing, meaning like when you are on the track, the track changes every single lap. So you need to be adaptable right so that's a skill that is like that you know every second that you are on that race track you need to think and execute and change accordingly what you're seeing and what you're experiencing so that's incredibly important because we know about what happened with the pandemic right yeah. a lot that's that to me i started a new business during the yeah. pandemic because it's that the the thing that i learned from being adaptable you know like a change in whatever is there another thing that the sport taught me which i apply to all of my business is definitely learning strategy like when you race you need to know what or try to predict what the other person is going to do to be able to overtake them yeah so that's another important thing in business to try to kind of see two or three years ahead that would it could come and put the foundation down you know like in the in the moment that you are leaving your your project right so you need to be like a chess player type yeah. of person meaning like uh, like uh, the poker face in a way yeah. you know like learning and assimilating and listening listening is so more very important in life and then you know like uh, formulate your your uh, your plan and your strategy to to execute where you want to be so all yeah. of these skills you know and they never give up of course you know they right. all come from my sport so from that i try to pick and apply on everything i'm doing today Absolutely. And you continue to expand your, your businesses. Um, you expanded your uh, 211 brand in 2010 and, and developed 211 Engaging. Uh, mm -hmm. Give us a glimpse into kind of what that new venture entails and, 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 and how that fit into your, your overall vision for the, the 211 brand. Yeah, the 211 brand was kind of like a, a umbrella brand, mm -hmm. you know, where I kind of like create all of these branches out of it right so yes yeah, so, so there was a motocross school there was a consulting part that which we were bringing company from europe to united states to open branch within the motorsport industry and also the other way around yeah. you know if there were a company in the us and they wanted to go you know to honda in japan because i had those connection i was facilitating all of that uh, then like the elite motocross uh, group you know with the best best girl in the world and then the engagement part because even back then we were at the beginning of social media i yeah. already saw you know the engagement was going to be the very important part in life to be able to be visible right so yes it, those are like a little offset i would say from the big 211 brand and 211 only because that was my racing number okay so i used to race with number 211 and that's why i create that company back then i love it i love the connection to that and uh obviously your career keep kept going it, it, you know later on you did uh you uh, became like a liaison for telenova uh, nova uh, yes. which was kind of introducing like american motorsports to italian viewers uh, what, what responsibilities did you have as a as a liaison for the tv company <laughs> basically it was a very similar to what i used to do for brands that they wanted to be established in mm -hmm. one country instead of the other because again i'm italian there was an italian tv station they wanted an american product yeah. who they're gonna ask steffi because it lives <laughs> here now right so that was kind of like it's it's just um networking like network is super important. And once you have a very big networking group, you know, then you can say, yes, I know somebody that can do that, right? And mm -hmm. for me, you know, that was a specific opportunity that uh, my beloved country where I was born wanted to see more of American sport. So I'm like, I can put the two and two yeah. together. And that's how it happened. Eventually you became a CEO as well, uh, Fanatic mm -hmm. North America. Um, talk to us about, about that journey. I mean, that's, that seems like a yes. very different bridge into, uh, you know, another avenue for you. Yes, it is. But like a, a lot of things in my life, they happen because making the decision like that. Mm -hmm. So I share with you how this one happened. I was in Italy and I was going with a, a friend of mine to do a wine tasting. Okay. Okay. So we are doing the wine tasting and then uh, it was almost 
the time to close the white tasty. So we got there at the last minute. And it, in Italy, you know, you say a couple a couple words and make jokes and whatnot. And the owner of the place most likely says, "Yes, come on, drink a glass and then go." <laughs> you know, like it's kind of like that. So we went there, but the owner turned out that he was one of the main investor in this fancy company. There's an Italian company that makes motorcycle and electric transportation okay. in, with e-bikes, yeah. right? And I'm like, oh, interesting. I live in the United States and I think the electric transportation is going to come very yeah. soon and it's going to be very important thinking about sustainability. And the guy said, okay, let's open a bottle of wine. <laughs> <laughs> so we are opening the bottle of wine and all of a sudden one bottle of wine later or two. Yeah. <laughs> um, here we are calling the CEO of the company that is in Italy and said, we have now a branch in the United States. And that's how I became the CEO. There we go. I love it. That's awesome. And that's yes. really, that's a cool story because it, it just keeps going and expanding what you have to offer, you know, in this industry. Um, yeah. You, you are obviously now, uh, you know, working in a, uh, a ton of different roles still, but you founded in it esports in 2019, yes. Uh, yes. currently serve as the CEO and the senior managing yes. director there as well. Uh, tell us yes. a little bit about uh, in esports and and kind of how that all came together. Yes, so in esports uh, uh, happened as I was saying early on in this call, in this call, just because I was in Italy and I saw my little niece spending time watching video games. So as you know by now, I am a person that sees an opportunity yeah. and grabs it. <laughs> you know what I mean? So that's how I, I uh, started in it eSport, which I also have a, a separate branch that is called in it sport, mm -hmm. where we try to continue to work in the sport industry with that. But in it eSport is my main focus right now. And what we are doing, we are creating all of these cool events for minority and for women in sing racing. So we have in reality two verticals. One is the motorcycle because it's right. where my first love yeah. right? <laughs> and the other one is the 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 four wheel so in the motorcycle another story that is very very cool to share what happened is that uh, after i saw my little niece you know spending all of this time i'm like we don't have nothing like this for motorcycling yeah. you know and it is expensive to go racing two wheel or four wheels right so it tend to be a particular category of people doing that mm -hmm. so what can i do to change that by utilizing something that is very understood by many many people in the world which is gaming yeah. right so i'm like ah we can create digital championship attached to the in real life championship so i went to the ama which is the american motorcycle association and i i explained to them hey this is a great opportunity to get you know people that come from underprivileged um communities or that they will not even think about racing in real life but we can grab their attention right from the esport world and give them an opportunity to enjoy this beautiful community yeah. they told me this is brilliant we love that now you are the official promoter for <laughs> anything on two wheels say for esports and i'm like perfect so <laughs> like putting all this together now we have um, every wednesday night we have uh, the racing day is pretty much the identical uh, digital counterpart of the in real life race okay. that happens on Saturday, and uh, and we get eighty thousand people to watch this. It's insane, <laughs> you know. And the cool part is like the some of the top professional uh, young guys in the sport mm -hmm. they play in yeah. it. Yeah. So it's like making that bridge right from the digital world to the in real life world and you know better than me that this is kind of like the base for the metaverse, you mm -hmm. know, like creating everything from the gaming world and then give her the opportunity to have experience in the in real life. Yeah. So this is one vertical and the other vertical is actually the sim racing. Yep. And uh, we have a super cool event and I'm asking everybody to log in and watch it, you know, March 4th, because what we are doing here is screen to speed. Yep. So screen digital to speed. Guess what it means in real life. Yeah. And this is for women by women. So you know we are gonna uh, the face forward are just women in motorsport, 
and um, we already have the, the um, uh, qualifier for the show. So now the top 15 best female sim racing from all over the world will come to Las Vegas, okay, to race during the NASCAR race, okay? Okay. So there is the NASCAR race happening, and within it, we are having the eSport sim racing event yes. with the best female athlete in the world for sim racing. The winner of the competition, besides getting a prize, prize money, she will get a chance to be testing in a real team, in Porsche, real team. That's awesome. So for me, this is like amazing because it's like giving opportunity to people and yeah. maybe having an opportunity to see and discover talent that you maybe otherwise will never know about it because they will don't have the opportunity to start the go-kart racing or go-kart right. route, you know, to get into motorsport. But it's not just about that. It's just not everybody's going to want to be, you know, a professional uh, driver, you know, a professional racer. Yeah. But by doing this, you know, we can bring a diverse group of people into the sport and opening the door. Maybe somebody can be a broadcaster like you, you know, yeah. And, yeah. In, in the motorsport industry or, you know, they become a marketing manager or they are opening a company just because they make this networking connection, you know, by just being exposed to it. So, yeah, mark your calendar. March yeah, absolutely. 4th. March 4th. <laughs> screen to speed uh and that's so it's that's in las vegas right mm -hmm. that's going to be incredible and and happening at the same time as as the nascar race which has got to be pretty fun and there's a ton of the, like the nascar drivers that play sim racing yes, uh, and, they, yes. and they swear this is as close as it gets to you know the real thing which is, is huge obviously uh we saw obviously that a lot during the pandemic where races were, uh, you know, on TV, but it was iRacing versus, you know, uh, the real NASCAR events. Um, but that, that's, that's a huge, uh, huge opportunity for you. What, what really inspired you to get involved with the, the screen to speed uh, event? I, again, it was just an idea. Yeah. <laughs> so it starts, it always starts with an idea and I'm like, yeah, let's do this. And then putting the pieces of the puzzle together, you know, I feel like I'm authentic, you know, that's what you get. Yeah. This is Steffi, right? Exactly. So, you know, like by being yourself, you know, you get the chance to meet the right people and that they might have the same the same uh, idea in mind, the same mission. And I was lucky enough that Pennzoil, you know, jumped in and for the performance jumped in. They say, yeah, we want to support this because we believe we can open door for more women into motorsport. So it's amazing. It's yeah. just amazing to be able to have companies that they see your same vision, yep. you know, and support you and then putting, you know, like uh, um, the necessary funding behind, you know, to be able to execute. And uh, it, it's a very empowering for sure. Absolutely. And obviously from uh, in esports and, and all of the other verticals that you have, um, you know, th this continues to grow. Uh, where, where do you see uh, your company is going in, in the future. Do you do you see is more heavily sided in the in the esports world or yes, uh, so, absolutely. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We're gonna be uh, in the esports world. We have a, a, another project that we are trying to put together right now, and uh, it, they will involve the Indy 500, and then it's gonna be a sim for STEM. Okay. So we're gonna use uh, sim racing and, and racing, you know, to create activities for uh, a high schooler. So in that way, it's an end-on program, yep. and then you know they can learn about it, and then they can learn what it will take to be in the motorsport world, and then we'll expose them to the Indy 500. Yeah. So it's kind of like doing digitally and then bring them there. And I believe that you know. If people can have a passion when they are in their teenage year, then, you know, they can probably say, hmm, maybe that's what I want to do, yeah. you know. Do you feel like and this there is... are other things? Too, yeah, of course. Share. <laughs> of course. Do you feel like this is like the world of esports and traditional sports that it's really helping bridge that gap between a younger audience and the already existing, you know, motorsports industry? Absolutely. I think for a Esport in general, you know, like we all know by now that it's a great opportunity for either brand to get involved and mm -hmm. learn and meet a consumer at their level, right? But also, I feel that uh, sim racing, it's very cool because it's relatable. Yeah. 
So you can talk to anybody. You can talk with grandpa and grandma and explain, hey, this is a car, and they understand what that is. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Whereas if you try to explain ah, a Valorant or a CSGO, they're going to be like, ah, what is this thing on the screen, right? So I feel that sim racing can also be a very good um, opportunity to expose maybe leave, leave older people that they are most of the time the decision makers, you know, to understand why esport is doing what it's doing, you yeah. know, and why we are creating this community, why we wanted to make safe space where everyone is welcome, you know, because the people they are in, in, in gaming, they are going to be, you know, the, the, the leader of the future, right? Yeah. So I think creating that connection is incredibly important. And I feel like with Sim, it's a little bit easier because you can talk about the same yeah. thing. Remember when I was saying early, you know, they always try to find how to be relatable, even when I was on the wheelchair. Mm -hmm. This is the same concept, right? Yeah. You know, to bring over, you know, something that can be explained and understood by virtually anybody yeah. in the world. Absolutely. And obviously, as you know, the industry grows, um, you know, here at Full Sail, we have a ton of students that are, you know, really considering careers in, in, in the world yes. of esports after they graduate. What, what sort of advice would you give to uh, students and new uh, grads as they in, embark on their journey into esports? Network. Yes, <laughs> right? Network. Talk to anybody. <laughs> Don't be shy. You know, if you think you have some uh, skill or ideals or whatever, don't be shy. Reach out to people. Of course, respect their time, you know, yeah. like but at the same time, just reach out because more often than not, people like, oh, okay, I'm interested in listening to what you have to say. So just network, meet mm -hmm. as many people as possible, keep a mental log of what they are and what they do, and then you know, also provide connection, you know, like a lot of time if somebody comes to me and say, hey, do you know somebody here and there? I'm like, yeah, of course, here. You know, like um, more of a community feeling we can create. I feel that more we can be, you know, people that uh, can make changes in the world. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I feel like, you know, obviously you've had this incredible uh, career and journey um, from the traditional side into uh, the world of esports and sim racing. Uh, obviously, sim racing has exploded in popularity. Uh, obviously, the pandemic probably helped out a little bit, but yep. you know, it really opened up a lot of people to say, "Whoa, I could go do. I could, I have a computer. I could go do this, or I have a console. I can go play this." Uh, where Where do you see the industry heading? Um, you know, in the next five years or so. Uh, and what sort of um, key trends do you think are going to continue to develop or, or watch out for when it comes to uh, sim racing? Well, for sim, I think it's going to continue to grow for more more championship and more event. And of course, the thing that I feel that um, will continue to happen is more of a mix between the in real life sport and the sim racing part mm -hmm. of it, meaning like more and more that we're going to go, every team out there is going to have the sim racing team, you know? So it's because not only because you can train on it, as you said a little bit ago, but because it could be a grassroots program, yeah. you know, to discover talent. So I see that this is going to continue to expand, you know, like for me, I'm going to continue to do it for the underdogs, which yeah. is women and minorities. <laughs> You know, like, and um, and then, yes, I think it's going to continue to grow in that way and becoming more, um, it's never going to be a substitution for in real life race, but it's going to be an add-on. Yeah. So more and more people are, and teams and sponsor, even the athletes themselves, you know, this is what some suggestions sometimes I say to, to in real life driver. It's like you have all of this visibility when you are in a NASCAR car. Think about it, how much visibility you can have on Twitch. Yeah. You know, if you also play that. So now you immediately add double or triple yep. your exposure. And a sponsor is going to be like, hmm, I like this. One. Exactly. <laughs> you know? So it's all about connecting the dots, the dots at the end. So for me, I, I love that because I have the passion, you know, so I'm going to continue to do what I can to expand the world of sim racing and, and, and motorsport. And Let's see what's going to happen. Absolutely. Well, Stevie, thank you so much for being a guest on Have Game Will Travel. Uh, I feel like we've we've gone through this whole journey with you. And uh, obviously want to give you some time to promote uh, anything as well as let people yes. know where they can find you, how to get in contact with you. 
Uh, so go ahead and drop that. Yes, so Init Esports is my company. So um, the show screen to speed will be on Init Esports Twitch account. So it will be all one word, Init, I-N-I-T, Esports. And then if you want to follow me, my name is Steffi Bao, S-T-E-F-Y-B-A-U. And I'm on all the social with that name. So sure. you can follow me like that. Awesome. Well, thank you again so much. Uh, our next episode was going to be on March Ninth uh, with esports Hector, uh, who's the head of performance at Parabellum Esports. Definitely tune into that. But thank you guys so much for hanging out with us today, and we will see you next time.